Herkese merhaba. Damodaran Hoca ile değerleme sınıfı adıyla oluşturduğum Türkçe altyazılı video serisi devam ediyor. Ancak izninizle bir iki konuya değinmek istiyorum. Öncelikle destek veren ve katılan herkese teşekkür ederim. Bu süreçte sizlerden çok güzel geri dönüşler aldım ve elimden geldiğince bu projeyi kaliteli bir şekilde sürdürmeye çalışacağım. Yeni öğrendiğim sevindirici bir girişmede daha önceki videonun giriş kısmında bahsetmiş olduğum Warren Buffett tarzı adlı kitabın yeni basımında düzeltme önerilerimin dikkate alınması oldu. Bu kapsamda başta Sayın Ali Perşembe olmak üzere Skala yayıncılığa teşekkürlerimi bir kere de buradan sunmak isterim. Başta akıllı yatırımcı olmak üzere diğer kitaplardaki ve çalışmalardaki düzeltme önerilerimin de benzer bir şekilde karşılık bulmasından oldukça mutlu olacağımı belirtmek isterim. Videolarla ilgili sorulara gelirsek, her cumartesi bir yayın yapmak niyetindeyim. Ancak kendi işlerim ve kitap çevirileri nedeniyle tutamayacağım bir söz de vermek istemem. Diğer bir soru da İngilizce altyazılar üzerineydi. Bunun için video akarken ben burada sizini kıstım ama gördüğünüz gibi sistemin üretmiş olduğu İngilizce altyazılar ve benim yazdığım Türkçe altyazılar var. Ekranın alt kısmında bulunan altyazı tuşuna basarak sistemin üretmiş olduğu İngilizce altyazıları bu şekilde kapatabilirsiniz. Son olarak bir de Lemmings yani yabani sıçanlar hakkında kısa bir açıklama yaparak Sizleri Damodoran Hoca'nın videosunun devamıyla baş başa bırakacağım. Britannica Ansiklopedisi zamanında bu konuda bir çalışma yapmış ve yabani sıçanların aslında toplu bir intihar eylemi yapmadığını, nüfuslarının belirli süreler içerisinde 3-4 yıl gibi artması nedeniyle belirli bir bölgede yoğunluk olması sebebiyle göç ettiklerini belirtmiştir. Yabani sıçanlar her ne kadar yüzebiliyor olsalar da aralarında ölenler, kayıplar olabilmektedir. İlginç olan ise Damodoran Hoca'nın yatırımcı tipleri ile yabani sıçanların davranış şekli arasında yapmış olduğu analojidir. Bu davranışın bu kadar yaygın olarak biliniyor olmasının arkasında yatan sebep ise insan davranışları üzerine bir metafordur. Bu da kalabalıkların yanılgısı olarak adlandırabileceğimiz sürü psikolojisi kökenlidir. Zaten videoda da ilk yatırımcı tipi Momentum Investor olarak adlandırdığımız Kalabalıkla hareket etmek üzerineydi. İkincisi ise Ayyogi'nin ortalamadan daha zeki olabilme anlayışı üzerine kurulu olan kalabalıkla hareket edip son anda kalabalıktan ayrılma psikolojisiydi. Üçüncüsü ise değerlemenin temelini esas alan, yaptığımız iş için bilinçli ve mantıklı karar alma süreçlerini çalıştıran bir değer belirleme yani bir can yeleği giymek üzerineydi. Buyurun videonun devamını seyredelim. Haftaya görüşmek üzere. So having laid that foundation, let me actually go on and talk about what I call the Bermuda Triangle evaluation. The three big reasons why valuations fail. And it's not about the numbers, it's not about the models, it's not about the metrics. Here's the first and biggest problem in valuation. Most people when they sit down to value a company or a business already have a preconception of what they expect to see as the value. It's very difficult not to. We almost never start with a blank slate when you value a company. Everything you've read about the company, everything you know about the company is going to become part of that preconception. The great irony is the more you know about a company, the stronger those preconceptions are. And when those preconceptions get set, your valuation follows. So if I think a company is a great company, guess what? My valuation is going to deliver a high value. In fact, let me add to that proposition. You tell me who pays you to do evaluation, how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is going to be and how much the bias is going to be. This is, I think, one of the fundamental rules in valuation. When I see a valuation cross my desk, before I look at the numbers and the assumptions, I ask two questions. Who did this valuation? Who paid them to do this valuation? Because your biases are going to be preset by what your mission is. If you're an investment banker and I come to you for evaluation of a target company and I really want to take over the target company, remember, your mission is to get the deal done. You're going to find a way to justify that value. Not surprisingly, your valuation will deliver exactly the result I hope to see, that this company is a bargain. Second big misconception about valuation, 
that valuation is somehow a science. You know what feeds into this? You sit in front of computers with models and you enter numbers and after a while you tell yourself, well, I'm being objective. All I'm doing is using numbers. Well, don't be deceived. Even though you might be using numbers, those numbers are estimates. And when you think about those estimates, those estimates are going to come with a great deal of uncertainty and uncertainty scares people. So when you do evaluation, one of the tests you ask yourself is, am I comfortable? Am I certain about these numbers? And especially if you come from a quantitative background, you're going to look at those numbers and say, well, I'm really uncomfortable. These numbers could be wrong. Well, guess what? They're always going to be wrong because you're forecasting the future. And one of the great ironies in valuation is the more uncomfortable you feel valuing a company, the greater the payoff to doing a valuation. That sounds strange, right? You're valuing a technology company with a lot of growth potential. You are going to be more uncomfortable than when you value a stable company where everything is pretty much set. But those technology companies with growth potential, those are exactly the companies where you should persevere. Make your best estimates. And remember that most people give up on these companies. And here's the third misconception about valuation. If you make a model bigger, it's going to get better. And it's so easy to build big models now. As you build these big models in Excel or whatever your tool of choice is, remember, you have to make those assumptions, those inputs that drive these models. And as these models get really complex, two things happen. One is these models become black boxes. After a while, it's not clear who's running whom. Are you running the model? Or is the model running you? The other is you have input fatigue. At some point in time, as you start entering those numbers, it becomes garbage in, garbage out. So here's a message I hope to deliver. As you look at valuations, one of the first things you should try to do is be parsimonious. What do I mean by that? If you can value a company with three inputs, don't go looking for five. If you can value a company with three years of forecast, don't do 10. Less is more. So having laid the table for valuation, let's look at the three broad approaches that there are to valuing a business. And there are only three. The first I'm gonna call intrinsic valuation. In intrinsic valuation, you value a business, you value a company based on its fundamentals, its cash flows, its growth, its risk. Discounted cash flow valuation is the most common tool used for estimating intrinsic value, but it's not the only one. But the key in intrinsic valuation is it's all about the business. The second approach to valuation I call relative valuation. And as I describe it, it's going to sound familiar. To value an asset in relative valuation, you look at what similar assets are being priced at by the market right now. And once you find them, you use that as your basis for valuing this asset. Think about it. If you look at an equity research report, what do you see? You see a multiple, right? Price earnings, EV to EBITDA, price to book. And you see a bunch of companies. And what the analyst is saying is, look at these companies and look at this one. Based on how these other companies are being valued, I think, this company is cheap or expensive. Those two approaches to valuation by far dominate all of valuation. And we'll talk about which one is dominant. But there's a third and final approach to valuation. The third approach to valuation, and this is perhaps the only new and perhaps sophisticated aspect that's new to valuation, is applying option pricing models in the context of valuing these assets that have contingent cash flows. What are contingent cash flows? Well, this asset will have value only if something happens. So if you're a biotechnology company, you have a patent working its way through the pipeline. It'll have value only if you get FDA approval. You're an undeveloped oil reserve company. Those oil reserves will have value only if oil pr prices go up beyond a certain level. So collectively, you can take valuation approaches and break them down into these three basic approaches. Underlying each approach, though, is an assumption about how markets work or better still, how they don't work. Each of these approaches assumes that markets make mistakes. Saying, so why do we need that assumption? If markets never made mistakes, there would be no point to valuing publicly traded companies, right? The market price of the company would be the best estimate of the value of the company. So every one of these approaches makes an assumption about market mistakes, but they all make different assumptions about how markets make mistakes and how those mistakes get corrected. So to set the table on these different approaches, let me give you a very quick introduction into each of these approaches. Let's start with discounted cash flow valuation or intrinsic valuation. What is it? In discounted cash flow valuation, the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. Nothing more, nothing less. 
you're trying to estimate the intrinsic value of a business based on its cash flows. And if you break down a discounted cash flow model, it has three ingredients. You'll see cash flows, you'll see a discount rate that reflects a risk in those cash flows, and you'll see a life for the asset you're valuing, which could be five years, 10 years, it could be forever. And when you use discounted cash flow valuation, you are assuming that markets make mistakes in valuing individual companies and that they correct these mistakes over time. So if you ask me what the hidden ingredient for using discounted cash flow valuation is, you need a long time horizon. Because markets can make mistakes, you can find those mistakes, but there is no guarantee that those mistakes will get corrected in the next three months or six months or even a year. The longer your time horizon, the better off you are using discounted cash flow valuation. The second approach to valuation is relative valuation. In relative valuation, you value an asset based on how similar assets are priced. You've given up an intrinsic valuation when you do relative valuation. You say, I don't know what the intrinsic value is. I'm going to let the market tell me. And if you break down relative valuation, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see a scale measure of price. What do I mean by that? You might not be able to compare the values of individual companies because some are smaller, some are larger. But if you divide that value by earnings or book value, in other words, you use a multiple, you are essentially comparing numbers which are comparable. The second ingredient you need for relative valuation is you need to find other investments that look just like yours. That might be easy in some cases. It's difficult when, you look, when you're talking about companies. Find me a company that's similar to Microsoft or Apple. It's tough to do, right? So what you will often find is analysts defining something as comparable, then waving their hands and saying, you know what, they're probably not that comparable. Which brings me to the third step. You need to control for differences across these investments, growth and risk and cash flows. So find a multiple scale version of a value, look for comparables, control for differences. What kind of mistakes do you assume markets make when you use relative valuation? You actually assume that markets are right on average, but that they're wrong in individual companies. And that they're wrong in individual companies, that those mistakes will get corrected sooner rather than later. Which brings me to the third and final approach to valuation, which is using option pricing in the context of valuation. As I said, option pricing models have been around a long time. What we're talking about, though, is using those option pricing models to value businesses or assets that have option-like characteristics. What are those? Options derive their value from an underlying asset. They have a contingent payoff, and they have a limited life. So here are some very generic examples of option-like examples in valuation that we might try to find a use for. The first, as I pointed out, is a natural resource company with undeveloped reserves, an oil, an oil company with undeveloped oil reserves, a gold mining company with gold reserves. There, the option is those undeveloped reserves that the company can choose to develop, but will do so only if the price is right. The second is, an, is a biotechnology, a pharmaceutical company with a patent could be any technology company with a patent that's not viable right now, but potentially could be viable in the future. And the third example, and this is fairly unusual, is if you buy stock in a deeply troubled company, a money-losing company with a lot of debt, I'm going to argue that you're effectively buying an option. So those are potentially places where we might be able to find uses for option pricing. That pretty much covers what I want to do in this session. So in summary, we're looking at different approaches to valuation. In the future session, we're going to flesh these approaches out and look at ways in which we can actually value companies with these approaches.